Hi, welcome to another episode of Real Gold, where we discuss classic films, their relevance and importance, and whether they deserve the awards they receive. I am your host, Matt Duffy. Today is a special episode of Real Gold. I recently just read the book, Pictures Out of Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood by Mark Harris. The book discusses the five films that were nominated for Best Picture at the 40th Academy Awards in 1968. Those five films are Bonnie and Clyde, Dr. Doolittle, The Graduate, Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, and In the Heat of the Night. Reading the book inspired me to talk about this Best Picture race specifically because the five films nominated are truly special in their own way. 1967 was an iconic year for filmmaking, so I want to talk about Hollywood at the time. I will briefly discuss the five films, and then I'll head into the Best Picture race. So, let's dive in. Now, during the late 1960s, Hollywood is in a bit of a state of chaos. The studio system is rapidly declining. Studios like Paramount and Warner Brothers are being acquired by companies like Gulf Western and Seven Arts. Audiences' tastes are changing. You know, the studios are churning out these big budget musicals, westerns, historical epics, but they're not making a lot of money at the box office. You also have baby boomers who are coming of age at this time and they don't feel represented nor are they targeted by the film industry. So all these little problems are bubbling up to the surface. Now you have this new crop of writers and directors and actors who have a different approach to filmmaking. It's less producer-driven content and more artistic control over the work. These films are shot on location. They have a naturalistic approach to filmmaking and acting. They are sometimes independently produced. And thanks to the new MPAA rating system, the taboo content that was forbidden by old Hollywood is now available. So these films are the ones that will change Hollywood and the way that films are made. The first picture we're gonna talk about that was nominated for Best Picture is Bonnie and Clyde. Well, I'm Miss Bonnie Parker, and this here's Mr. Clyde Barrow. We robbed Thanks. Warren Beatty and Faye Dunaway play the notorious duo who fall in love and embark on a crime spree, stealing cars and robbing banks. Gene Hackman and Estelle Parsons play Clyde's brother Buck and his wife Blanche. Michael J. Pollard plays accomplice C.W. Moss. Now, I love this film. I love the actors in it. I thought the screenplay was excellent. And overall, I really enjoyed the film. David Newman and Robert Benton wrote the screenplay after being inspired by the French New Wave films that were out at the time that they loved and thought there should be more of. Warren Beatty, who had hit a high in his career with Splendor in the Grass in 1961, is on a bit of a roller coaster. He doesn't want to be a pretty face in the tabloids anymore. He wants to be something more. And he sees the script and realizes this is his chance. He was able to acquire some money through Warner Brothers and produce the film. One of my favorite stories is that whenever Jack Warner wanted to end an argument with someone, he would look out his office window, point at the water tower, and say, you know whose initials are on there? Mine. One day in an argument with Warren Beatty over Bonnie and Clyde, which Jack Warner was not thrilled about at all, he ended it saying, kid, you know whose initials on there? Mine. Warren Beatty, the persuasive charmer that he is, said, no, those are actually my initials. Gotta hand it to Warren Beatty for that. Now, if I had to pick my one scene or my one shot for this film, it has to be the ending, that dance of death. Dee Dee Allen was the film editor on the film and she is snubbed egregiously at the Oscars. She should have been nominated and she probably should have won the Oscar that year, but that's another story. It is original and iconic in any way possible. Now, when Bonnie and Clyde first came out, the reviews were not good. Bosley Crowther from the New York Times said, this is a cheap piece of bald face slapstick. And Jack Warner, who had disdained the production from the beginning, was not thrilled. They pulled it out of many of the theaters it was in, only put in a few, but Warren Beatty persisted. He knew this film had what it took. Things started to change around the time Pauline Kael wrote her article for The New Yorker. Bonnie and Clyde is the most excitingly American, American movie since The Manchurian Candidate. The audience is alive to it. Joe Morgenstern from Newsweek saw it for a second time with his wife and immediately wrote a mea culpa to encouraging people to see it. From there, it snowballed. Audiences went crazy over it. Critics adored it. Faye Dunaway and Warren Beatty ended up making the cover of Time that year in December. Off a budget of $2.5 million, 
the film made around 51 million 70 worldwide. This is one of the films that paves the way for this new generation of writers, directors, and actors to create these kind of films. They have violence, they have a little bit of sex in them, and the approach that is made to them is innovative. And it made stars out of its actors. Faye Dunaway became the it girl of the 70s. Warren Beatty now isn't just a pretty face actor, he's a producer. He will then become a director with Reds. Next up, we have Dr. Doolittle. Rex Harrison plays the titular role of Dr. John Doolittle. He's a veterinarian who can literally talk to the animals. He sets off and leaves England to search for the great pink sea snail. Samantha Egger, Anthony Newley, and Richard Attenborough have supporting performances in the film. Dr. Doolittle is notorious for being one of those big budget family musical bombs. It was produced after the success 20th Century Fox had with The Sound of Music. Warner Brothers had the success of My Fair Lady. The budget ended up being about $17 million, three times its original budget, and it only made $9 million. There were a lot of problems in the pre-production of the film that attributed to the demise of this film. You had the 1,300 animals that were used for the film that once they got to the UK to film had to be quarantined. And then there was a bunch of animal abuse that went on the set too. Production was always being halted because of the weather. Castle Colm in the UK ended up in June when they were filming having about an average of 15 days of rain a month. In St. Lucia, it wasn't rain this time. It was the insects and the tropical storms. Three. You had the creative demands by the star, Rex Harrison. He was a bit of a diva on set, and he was prone to a drink or two. He also was self-conscious against the younger people in the cast. He would say derogatory things to them. He would make comments to Samantha Egger and to Anthony Newley, who was Jewish. And with Rex Harrison demanding certain things and refusing to walk off set, you know, they had to hire Christopher Plummer as a standby in case things didn't work out with Rex Harrison. Next, you had Leslie Bercuse, who was the composer for the film, stepped in after Alan J. Lerner left the film. Leslie really did a good job and did his best with the score and the music. The last thing is the marketing. They had this huge spread. They had about $200 million worth of promotional items that were gonna be sent out. Because the film tanked, none of it was used. All these problems nearly made 20th Century Fox bankrupt. This film almost took down a whole Studio. Things were not looking positive for the film. Bosley Crowther from the New York Times said that Dr. Doolittle, the music is not exceptional, the rendering of the songs lacks variety, and the pace is slow and without surprise. The last shot of Mr. Harrison riding off on the giant lunar moth is embarrassing, I think even for children. Even though it tanked at the box office in 1967, they brought it back in the late 1990s with Eddie Murphy, and that he was able to make into a franchise. I don't think I could say the same for Robert Downey Jr. this year. In the winter of 1967, even though the reviews were mixed to negative, 20th Century Fox pulled out all its stops for an Oscar campaign. So what they did was they held 16 consecutive nights of screenings for Studio Academy members that offered dinner and champagne after the film. It was the 60s, you kinda could get away with that stuff. Now with the failure of this film, and with Camelot, the big budget family musical ultimately died. You've never seen anything like it in your life. Enter the wonderful world of Dr. Doolittle. Now, on to The Graduate. Here we are, you got me into your house, you give me a drink, you put on music, now you start opening up your personal life to me and tell me your husband won't be home for hours. So? Mrs. Robinson, you're trying to seduce me. <laughs> Aren't you? Benjamin Braddock, a recent college graduate, returns home disillusioned about life and begins an affair with Mrs. Robinson, the wife of his father's business partner. Things then grow complicated when Ben falls in love with Elaine, Mrs. Robinson's daughter. Dustin Hoffman plays Benjamin, and Bancroft plays Mrs. Robinson, and Catherine Ross plays Elaine. I loved this film. I, it's probably my favorite of the five, with Bonnie and Clyde being this close second. This is one of those ones where you have to see it. If I had to pick my one scene and my one shot, there's so many to even think about. But um, 
you have the plastic scene, you have the seduction scene, the uh, pillow talk scene, and that ending, I mean, I've never seen anything else like it. I think for me, the most interesting part about the production of this film was the casting of it. With the wrong cast, this film totally could have gone in a different way and could have even been a stinker. For the casting for Benjamin, you had actors like Warren Beatty, George Hamilton, George Pippard vying for the part, and then you had Robert Redford, who lobbied hard for the part, actually. My favorite story about this is Robert Redford went, was talking to Mike Nichols about the part, and Mike Nichols kept saying, no, you can't play the part. You know, you're not a loser. And Robert Redford says, I'm an actor. I can play a loser. And Mike Nichols says to him, okay, have you ever struck out with a girl? And Robert Redford looks at him and laughs and says, what do you mean? Mike Nichols could not find a Benjamin to save his life. And then he auditioned Dustin Hoffman, who at the time was an off-Broadway actor, just struggling to make ends meet. And he realized, this is my Benjamin. This is who I'm, I'm not looking for some waspy, sun-kissed Southern Californian guy. I need someone who is the antithesis of that. That's why he has the internal crisis that he has. For the part of Elaine, you had a mix of old Hollywood and new Hollywood actors. A lot of these up and coming young women, Candace Bergen, Jane Fonda, Natalie Wood, and Margaret, all were vying for the part that ends up going to Catherine Ross. She brings this emotional core that is needed. And then for the part of Mrs. Robinson, you have Patricia Neal, Deborah Carr, Jeanne Moreau, Ava Gardner, who lobbied hard for the part, Doris Day, whose husband didn't even show her the script. He said it was distasteful. And then it ultimately fell in the hands of Anne Bancroft, the Tony and Oscar winning actress. The way that she slither and slinks around the room in that seduction scene, her iciness towards Benjamin, but then the passion that she kind of fuels into it. Oh, she's just awesome in it. Now the film was independently produced for a budget of $3 million. Box office was through the roof. It was the number one film in 1967. There were lines out the door. It made over $100 million. Roger Ebert called it the funniest American comedy of the year. Hoffman is so painfully awkward and ethical that we are forced to admit we would act pretty much as he does, even in his most extreme moments. Bancroft, in a tricky role, is magnificently sexy, shrewish, and self-possessed enough to make the seduction convincing. Interestingly enough, 30 years later, Roger Ebert would do another review for the film, this time siding more with Mrs. Robinson and even calling Benjamin a bit of a creep. The word of mouth just spread about this film. This was the voice of a generation. These baby boomers felt lost and this was a movie that targeted them and they loved it. The first time I saw the film, I, I just graduated from college and even then, there were moments of Benjamin's strife that I could relate to. AFI had their top 100 songs. Number six was Mrs. Robinson, the infamous song by Simon and Garfunkel, which ended up winning a Grammy that year too. It was the number one pop song in 1968. The success of The Graduate made its director and its actors stars. I mean, Mike Nichols was primarily a Broadway director at this time. He did his first film the year before, Who Was Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and that got 13 Oscar nominations. So that kind of catapulted him. This made him even bigger and more desired. It stars Dustin Hoffman skyrocketed. He was, he'd be in Midnight Cowboy. He'd win two Oscars within the next 20 years. Catherine Ross became a leading lady. And Anne Bancroft, I would argue this is her most iconic role. And she won an Oscar in 1962 for The Miracle Worker. The next film is Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. In 1967 San Francisco, liberal stalwarts Matt and Christina Drayton, played by Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn, are in a state of shock when their daughter Joey brings home her new fiance, Dr. John Prentice, who just so happens to be African-American. Sidney Portier plays John, Katherine Houghton plays Joey, Cecil Kellway plays Monsignor Ryan, B. Richards and Roy E. Glenn Sr. play Mr. and Mrs. Prentice. Now, this is a great film. It has that kind of drawing room humor and it has great performances by all of its leads. I've already discussed this film in a previous episode, so if you wanna see a more in-depth review about Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, check out episode five. So I'm gonna keep it a little brief here. One of the points I think 
think is so interesting about this film is the production of the film. Stanley Kramer had a tough time producing the film because of Spencer Tracy's failing health. Columbia denied Spencer health insurance. So Stanley Kramer and Katherine Hepburn had to put their salaries in escrow as backing. And the film was basically shot in two scripts. The days where Spencer Tracy was available to shoot and the days when he wasn't. When he wasn't shooting, Sidney Poitier said he either shot with a stand-in or just an empty chair. Now the two major things about this film are one, the power of Sidney Poitier. You know, this was a landmark year for him. In 1967, he had three top grossing hits. He had this, he had In the Heat of the Night, which we'll get into. Then he had To Sir With Love. You also had the power of Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn together. This was their ninth and final film together. The two of them remind me of that couple in high school that everyone fawns over. You know, they, they, they are that couple. Like when you think of old Hollywood, you think of the two of them. A lot of the publicity around the film revolved around them. This could be the last time you see them together. They had shots taken of them on set. Even though interracial marriage is legal, the conflict of the film is still relevant and pertains to many people regardless of your race, your gender, your sexual orientation. So I think that's what people should really take from this film now. Jeffrey Fleischman from the LA Times says, the film was a mannered Hollywood take on an incendiary topic. Some critics found it bland and patronizing, but it was a commercial hit that epitomized mainstream Hollywood's liberal leanings at a time when more revolutionary films about social upheaval were recasting American sensibilities. This was that old guard Hollywood film at the time. You had Columbia Pictures, you had Stanley Kramer, and then you had Spencer Tracy and Katherine Hepburn. It's relevance today is important. You have films like Get Out and Guess Who that take from this film. You have something like Loving, which is another film about interracial marriage. It's a great film with a great ensemble and a good screenplay. What more do you want? But where necessary, you'll just have to cling tight to each other and say, screw all those people. Last but not least, we have our final film and the winner of Best Picture that year, In the Heat of the Night. After the murder of a wealthy factory owner, small town Mississippi chief Bill Gillespie, played by Rod Steiger, must use the help and expertise of Philadelphia detective Virgil Tibbs, played by Sidney Poitier, to solve the case. Now, I really enjoyed the film. It's not just a movie about racial conflict. It's a movie about brotherhood and these two guys from opposite sides of the spectrum coming together and solving a murder. It's, it's a murder mystery. It's a social thriller, you could even call it. And one of the things I enjoyed reading about and learning was Sidney Poitier in this film. He became the first African-American actor to win the Oscar for Best Actor in a Leading Role. He won in 1963 for Lilies of the Field. He was tired of playing these white savior parts. He, he wanted to be a positive influence on African-Americans, yet at the same time, he wanted better roles. So he had to appease the audience, which was predominantly white, as well as the filmmakers that were creating these films. So he was kind of in between a rock and a hard place. He wanted more challenging roles, but he he didn't want something that could deter him from doing more work. Hence this script. Sterling Siliphant does a great job with the script. And I think Norman Jewison does a great job directing. He gets great performances out of Sidney Poitier and out of Rod Steiger. He was your typical method actor. And he really brought it to the screen for this role. And if I had to pick my one scene, my one shot, the scene between Virgil Tibbs and Mr. Endicott is the best scene of the film. I gasped watching it. And I'm not going to spoil it, but you'll know. So much so that when the film came out, Norman Jewison went to a preview and he got concerned when the audience was laughing. He was like, this isn't a comedy, this is serious. That scene happened, audience was silent. Hal Ashby said to him, that's how you know the film's good. Variety says about the film, an excellent Sidney Poitier performance and an outstanding one by Rod Steiger overcomes some noteworthy flaws to make In the Heat of the Night an absorbing contemporary murder drama set in the deep redneck South. Now. United Artists had no intention of releasing the film in the South. They were nervous that there were gonna be protests and riots surrounding the film. They wanted nothing to do with that. So they had got the film on a budget of $2 million and had planned to release it in the North and the West and those cities. However, the film was a success, made $24 million, and it was released in those cities in the South where it did well. The same thing with Guess Who's Coming to Dinner. The popularity of those two films in the South, especially, alleviated those problems from the distributors and prevented that problem from happening anymore. 
out of all five films, In the Heat of the Night feels like a combination of the old Hollywood from Guess Who's Coming to Dinner and Dr. Doolittle and new Hollywood, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde. You have United Artists doing the distribution, but then you have Norman Jewison directing. You have Quincy Jones doing the composing. You have Sidney Poitier, method actors like Rod Steiger and Lee Grant. Hal Ashby is doing the editing. So all in all, it feels like not a safe vote, but a compromise between the two. I'm pretty sure of yourself, ain't you, Virgil? Virgil, that's a funny name for a nigga boy that comes from Philadelphia. What do they call you up there? They call me Mr. Tibbs. Now, leading up to the Oscars, the five films that were nominated for Best Picture really do represent the conflict that was going on in American society, as well as the one that was going on in Hollywood, that old versus new. Bonnie and Clyde, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, both received 10 nominations each. The Graduate, and In the Heat of the Night both received seven nominations, and Dr. Doolittle ended up getting nine nominations. This is also the first time that three films, The Graduate, Bonnie and Clyde, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, are all nominated for the big five. Best Picture, Director, Actor, Actress, Screenplay. This is also the only year that two films, Bonnie and Clyde, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner are both nominated in all four acting categories. So there was a lot of excitement leading up to the ceremony. The winner is In the Heat of the Night, Walter <laughs> Now, the 40th Academy Awards were scheduled for April 8th, 1968. And it was going to be this big spectacle, this big 40th birthday party with glitz and glamour. Academy president at the time, Gregory Peck, had intended for an all-out push for the acting nominees to attend. Before then, it was kind of very lax. This year, 18 of the 20 obliged. The two actors that were not there were Spencer Tracy, who had passed away the year before, and Katherine Hepburn. Then, not even a week before the Oscars, Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated, and the world stopped. Numerous black entertainers and performers that were scheduled to appear had backed out. Other actors and activists had called for a new date, so the Academy was stuck in a rut. Do they continue with the show or should they postpone it? What the Academy decided to do was then push it back two days. The new date was April 10th. Now, Academy membership in 1968, I'm sure looks very similar to the membership in 2020. It is mostly white, it is mostly older, and it is mostly male. So knowing this, we can see why the Academy tends to be a little more conservative in their choices. And then to see what is going on in Hollywood and in America at the time, it's no wonder why In the Heat of the Night one best picture. It's a film about racial conflict and brotherhood and about coming together to solve a crime. It had star power with Sidney Poitier, Rod Steiger, and an up and coming Norman Jewison. And it did very well at the box office too. So it had all those little factors. Plus timing is everything. I'm gonna tell you a quick story I read. So Norman Jewison was in Sun Valley where his son was in a ski race. His son got injured and he was in the waiting room. He's waiting there and all of a sudden, Bobby Kennedy is there too. So Bobby Kennedy is sitting there and they're talking and he starts to tell Bobby about In the Heat of the Night. Bobby Kennedy looks at him with awe and is amazed. He said to him, I know you're gonna do well with this film. Timing is everything in politics, in art, and in life. At the New York Film Critics Circle Awards, In the Heat of the Night wins Best Picture. Norman Jewison goes up to accept the award and lo and behold, look who is presenting him the award, Bobby Kennedy. Bobby Kennedy gives him the award and says, timing is everything. The winner is Leslie Brickus for Talk to the Animals. Dr. Doolittle will win two Oscars. It'll win the Oscar for Best Original Song, Talk to the Animals, and Best Visual Effects. The winner is Mike Nichols. The Graduate will only win one Oscar, Best Director for Mike Nichols. Catherine Hepburn, and guess who's coming to dinner? Guess Who's Coming to Dinner will win two Oscars for Best Leading Actress for Catherine Hepburn and Best Original Screenplay for William Rose. The winner is Estelle Parsons in Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde will win two Oscars as well. Best Supporting Actress for Estelle Parsons and Best Cinematography. And In the Heat of the Night will sweep and win five. It'll win Best Picture, Best Lead Actor for Rod Steiger, Best Adapted Screenplay, Sterling Silliphant, Best Film Editing, and Best Sound Mixing. 
All in all, each of these films are truly special in their own way and right. They are listed on numerous top 100 lists, they are on many must-see film guides, and they contain nostalgia for people that saw them before and give new experiences to people who have never seen them. And I truly recommend you guys to see, if not all five, at least one of them. They really are awesome. And before we sign off, I just want to say thank you for watching. And I'm going to leave you with a quote from Pictures at a Revolution. The success of the pictures in the class of 1967 focused Hollywood's attention on a new generation of movie makers and moviegoers and heralded what is now seen as a second golden age of studio movie making. But old Hollywood didn't disappear. It simply reinvented itself. I'm grateful to them and to the Academy and to the movies themselves. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really had a great time making this video and I hope you guys enjoyed it too. Feel free to like, hit subscribe, comment, share it with your friends or anyone that's interested and I'll be back soon with a new video. Catch you later.